If you would like to earn CPE credit for listening to the show, visit earmarkcpe.com, download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. Now on to the show. From Data Rails, this is FPNA Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FPNA Today. I am your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FPNA Guy, and you are listening to FPNA Today. FPNA Today is brought to you by Data Rails, financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis and discuss some of the biggest stories and challenges in the world of FPNA. We will provide you with actionable advice about financial planning and analysis. This is going to be your go-to resource for everything FPNA. I am thrilled to welcome today's guest to the show, Eeyore Liasco. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hey, Paul. Uh, great to be here. Thanks. Yeah, we're excited to have you. So just a little bit about him, and then I'll give him an opportunity to introduce himself. He's coming to us from London. He's currently the head of FPNA for Northern Europe at the Kraft Heinz Company. He earned his master's degree in biochemistry from University of Oxford, and he's worked for the Kraft Heinz Company ever since grad school in several different roles. So again, you know, welcome to the show. We're excited to have you and you know, talk a little bit of FPNA here with you today. No, yeah, amazing to be here. Uh, very happy to uh, to talk about anything FPA or anything else for that matter. Actually, all right. Well, we may take you up on that. There might be a su- surprise question. You never know. But why don't we start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and you know how you ended up where you're at? Yeah, look, uh, I think it's probably for a tell from the name. Uh, I'm not originally from London, uh, so I was born and raised actually in Russia originally, where my family's from, and I was very fortunate to be able to go to school in in, in the UK in London. And I've been here basically since, since the age of 12. So I went to school here, just south of London, then Ox- obviously Oxford University, studied biochemistry, which is probably quite a strange career choice after having done biochemistry for four years to move into FPNA specifically or finance in general. And then I, I started at, at Kraft Heinz as a, as a trainee. So that was, uh, well, just under six years ago. Um, I think I seriously considered always career in science. But I think the thing that attracted me to specifically Kraft Heinz and the industry overall was this fast-paced environment. I think that's something that probably attracted me. And probably one thing, I probably get too much in FBNA sometimes, the fast-paced environment. <laughs> but uh, uh, that was the big decision for me, you know. Uh, and look, I chose Kraft Heinz as a company because I really uh, the culture of ownership and the culture overall has really attracted me. Uh, and then, yeah, I started as a grad with no, I don't think, and I still don't think I do, uh, have a, I'm tied to an idea that I want to be in finance and FBNA for the rest of my life, you know. I wanted to enter world of business, a world of multifunctional, cross-functional business. Uh, and yeah, I started as a trainee. I actually did my project as part of the program. It's a general management program. Uh, I did my project in marketing, um, analyzing some of our launches, and then have basically ended up in various roles in finance. So I started uh, in commercial finance as an analyst. That was my kind of first proper job, working for back then what used to be our EMEA zone. So more for the zone team, not less hands-on, more, I guess, strategic. Um, then looked after ZBB, which is the way we manage fixed costs at Kraft Heinz, which is with, within the realm of FPNA for back then the newly created Northern Europe business. So I did that for just over a year and then entered a world of kind of real commercial finance or commercial business partnering, mm-hmm. having been a sales finance manager for just under two years for some of our big retailers here in the UK. And that was, that was, yeah, that was really fascinating. Uh, so having a really holistic experience, right, from, from that perspective. And then the last year has really been a roller coaster, to be honest, among other things going on. So I actually started the year looking, heading up our final transformation team, which I think we'll talk about probably later in a bit more detail. Uh, and then we had quite a few people changes here, and I've been given this great opportunity uh, heading up our FPNA team for Northern Europe, which I've now been doing for six months. It doesn't feel like six months. It feels like a lot longer. But I think uh, <laughs> a friend of mine... A very experienced friend of mine said, "An FBNA years feel like double." So uh, that sounds about right. No, I, I hear you. I worked for a company, and they had a reputation for you know burning people out. And one of the uh, agencies, like hiring agency, said, "Yeah, we consider anyone who's worked there in finance kind of FPNA. We look at it as they got about four years of work experience for every one year. You know, kind of your two for one, and yeah, because it was just a it was a pressure cooker, but learned a lot." But yeah, sometimes it can be a grind for sure. So, you know, as you're given your background, you know, I noticed you have a really unique background, right? 
we don't see a lot of biochemistry, as you mentioned. We see that occasionally, but it's not a common there. And then, you know, doing a marketing internship, you've run your own business. You're now in, in finance. So maybe kind of walk through your thinking of how you ended up finance specifically. You mentioned, you know, you're not looking your whole career necessarily to do finance. There's other things that interest you. So kind of maybe a little more detail on that path and what you think the benefits of, of having that diverse background, how that's helped you. Yeah, I think uh, it's a great question. I get asked that probably a lot of why on earth are you, are you not doing something actually like life changing, uh, <laughs> quite literally. Uh, sometimes think about it quite a lot. But look, I think uh, as obviously as a student, I did a few different internships. I did an internship in consultancy, I did an internship in big pharma. Uh, and then throughout my time at university, I ran my own business, which was a small kind of online clothing retailer. And I was always probably had a passion for having my own business in there. Then when it came to kind of, hey, finishing university, what am I going to do? Uh, with my degree, the obvious one is you go into and do a PhD, right? You do a PhD, makes sense. You're going to be a big time or small time scientist. I actually started some of the applications. And then basically for that reason, I was like, look, I, like, I had a great time for four years, but I don't think I can do it for another four. And I think the biggest thing for me was that I've had amazing professors and older friends who have done it and you could do the rest like for your entire life. You can be top of your field, but actually in the end have kind of nothing to show for it because that's kind of the world of science for you. Um, and it was too slow paced for me. So then came kind of the decision of what industry do I go to? Probably my CV, funnily enough, is pretty standard one for working in the city. So a bigger I know, audit, consult, like bank, et cetera. It's a, it's a good university. It's a science degree, STEM degree, they're quite common. Never attracted me. I've done an internship in consulting. It never attracted me as a starting point for my career, uh, to be honest. And then was look, I looked at a few other industries, but probably pharma would have been one. But then in pharma, I was like, I don't want to go to pharma and do, I don't know, sales or whatnot. <laughs> and to do science there, you needed to have a PhD. So back we go. And then FMCG really kind of appealed to me a lot because the tangible aspect of it, you know, you see it every day. It's very tangible. I actually had an internship in FMCG as well, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and then narrowing it down, I think uh, Kraft Heinz is a company I chose more for its culture, for its culture of ownership and meritocracy. And there is no kind of, you do this, two years, do this, two years. It's much more fast paced. And I mean, I've been very fortunate in my career as well, but I, I've really valued that. And then in terms of how I ended up in finance, I think I think finance is a great place to start your career overall, regardless of whether it's FPN or not. Because normally as a finance business partner to whatever team, you get a much more holistic understanding of the business. And then you get to FPNA, and that is like really holistic understanding of the business. And that's what I think I value the most. You learn so much. And that's probably part of the challenge. But did I ever think I will be in finance for my entire basically career? Probably not. What I tell you now, like, do I want to be there for the rest of my career? Also, probably not. But I really enjoy, I really do enjoy it. And I really valued it as a starting point. And having had very varied experience of finance, you kind of, you have that kind of palette, if you, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, of choice, which I think is great. Um, and I think naturally, I always like numbers. Like, I like facts. I like numbers. So it's probably not, like, it's probably a good fit. I um, want to be salesperson, probably, but uh, they, they, they don't let me go to customers. <laughs> <laughs> now, that, everything you said there makes sense. I can see, you know, you've put a lot of thought into it. You planned it out. And I totally agree with your point that, you get a great holistic view in finance, right? It's one of the few cross-functional parts of a business that has to understand all the other parts. You know, some cross-functional really don't need to understand what the other businesses are doing. A lot of IT, yeah, you got to understand a little bit of the data, the systems. But finance, you got to understand the economics, how things work, how to think about them, so you can really be that partner. So it's a great place to start. And in particular, FP&A is even more of an understanding because of that planning, the strategic thinking, the analysis. You really, to be good at your job, you have to deeply understand the business. And so I think, like you mentioned, it's a great place to start and it opens up all kinds of opportunities, right? You could go into operations, you get, you see people go into other areas, you see people go into sales, you know, there's all type of places you can go from FP&A and finance. Oh, that, that totally. makes a lot of sense to me. Like, you know, I gone from FPA to starting my own business. So I'm doing a little bit of everything now, some marketing, some sales, some yeah, finance stuff, you know, so I, I get it. 
So, you know, about, I think it was about six months ago now, you were, uh, you got the head of FP&A position for Northern Europe. So maybe can you talk a, a little bit about that experience? You know, what has it been like and what would you say has been the hardest part of the transition? Yeah, look, I think it was definitely unexpected. Like, I don't, I think we had, as I say, a few people changes. So it kind of, uh, the cards fell the way they did. As I say, it's been a very intense few, like six months. Uh, also started as we started kind of planning for our annual budget cycle. And obviously budget sits in a way as a, in the center of FPNA sometimes, maybe a bit too much. But uh, I've always been in and around my FPNA team, having been a finance, sales finance manager, CBB, et cetera. But I think uh, the hardest thing is scope. I think that's the hardest thing in that role. Because you go from in the morning talking about your performance of uh, maybe not this week, but this month, to in the afternoon talking about the marketing budgets for next year, to in the evening talking about the strap plan, the five-year strap plan, to then going back to get some analysis over to your zone team about something they need to use for some something for the street, even, you know? So mm-hmm. the scope, and it's I always compare it to even my role as a sales, like as a finance business partner to a commercial team, you're a bit of a jack of all trades. Because you do a bit of everything, but it's like the scope is still. A little bit, that little bit smaller. Here, you can just you can dive into so many things, which makes it hard to concentrate on one, and sometimes hard to prioritize. To be honest, um, but look, I, as I say, I I really like I actually like that scope. It just makes it quite difficult. But that's been the hardest in terms of uh, I think adjusting. And also, funnily enough, I moved from a transformation role, which is kind of the opposite in a way of like it's project focused. You need to you don't look at your daily sales. You don't look at what's going on today. You try to look ahead, right? You're try, mm-hmm. trying to solve people's problems. So that was a quite a big mind shift. I think I just switched to that one and I had to kind of unwind that again. Uh, but yeah, I think that that's been the hardest one. Uh, but I think, yeah, I really, like, and then really enjoying it. Uh, company Good, yeah. Months, I, I could see the mindset change and just the fact that different things can come up and it can be so different from one moment to the next, what you're talking about. Like you mentioned, I remember the exact same thing there, right? You're figuring out marketing budget here. And then next thing you know, you're doing some analysis on month end and then you're okay, well, what's the, what's the long-term plan for this product? And you, you, you have to understand all those, be able to switch gears and talk to different people. And it, it could take a lot. You can be very tired sometimes by the end of the day, just from the mental aspect of switching so much, even if it doesn't feel like a you know a heavy work day in the sense of ton of work, it can still be draining just from the That's how, exactly how quickly the biggest things problem can change. Paul, because you sometimes <laughs> end the day and you're like, have I tangibly done something? I don't know. Could be, I don't know, build a model, build a prepare a presentation, whatever it may be you do. And you're like, I've just spoken to like loads of people about loads of things, which is great. Look, you get to, as I say, that's the good part. You get to interact with all of these stakeholders from a from marketeers and sales to operations uh, to your kind of finance counterparts themselves. Uh, so like it's, it's a real scope. Yeah. You know, I experienced the same thing a little different, but right. Doing in my own business, sometimes I get to the end of the day and it's like, did I actually do anything I can build today? Yeah. So on top of switching all the time, it's like, that was all building today. So I didn't even make any money. You know, so it's just a totally different, you know, and then there's other days where you you're like, Oh, that was a good day. So I, I totally get it both from the FP&A and just now relating it to kind of some of my experiences. So I know you mentioned you're you know, nearing the end of budget. This is your first you know, full budget heading up FP&A. So what's that experience been like? Maybe talk to some of the challenges, how you approached it, those type of things. Yeah, I think budget is kind of a scary word people sometimes do, right? <laughs> uh, and in a world of, I think, relative stability of 15 years, now we are living in a world of double digit inflation everywhere in Europe, even more so maybe. And means planning and scenario planning becomes way harder. I think, look, budget, like b- budget also always comes on top of your kind of normal routine. You always still have your, your month end and all of these things, right? So it's been a, like in terms of the plan and everything, it's been okay. Look, it's a lot of stakeholder management. There is a lot of targets, changes, et cetera. So that's, that's always challenging, right? Uh, no, no one is ever happy, probably, um, <laughs> ever. Uh, but that's okay, right? It's, it's a target. It's, it's always hard to set to set these targets and, and make them. You make you need to make sure they're fair, right? And it falls onto you uh, to support the leadership team. Uh, 
but I think like there are a lot of things I think we we should always aim to simplify. That's my job in FPNA. I think is to try and simplify and help the teams. Um, but I think yeah, look o- overall, I think it's been an okay exercise. We're still finalizing, of course, a few bits and pieces. What we call kind of the FPNA kitchen work. We're in the process of doing that now and trying to close that just before Christmas here. Uh, but in terms of the plan, uh, I think we're look at like the. As I say, times have changed, which made these processes somewhat different. Uh, the, the focus area is somewhat different. I think the main one is your spread of what could happen, which is, I guess, scenario planning, used to be much narrower than it is today. Things could mm-hmm. be very good or very bad. And it makes, yeah, throws a, a few curveballs. For, for sure. The uh, range of scenario planning and the ability to adjust and that need is just, you know, increased so much over the last, you know, couple of years with COVID, with supply chain, with inflation, with all the things you mentioned, the energy crisis, and the list goes on, right? Global pandemic. It feels like the number of challenges are not slowing. That's for sure. You know what it is like. 13 different spreadsheets emailed out to 23 different budget holders, multiple iterations, version control, errors, back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. DataRails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. DataRails takes data from all of your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up to date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. So, you know, as you look back at this first experience, let's say, you know, it's five months ago and you're starting over, six months ago, whenever you started, what would you do differently this time? There's some things you'd change, I kind of, you know, what? Yeah, I think, I think we need, and we say that every year, to be honest, I've been part of the budget process if you're in finance, you do it's some capacity you do budget, right? Of and course. I've been in finance for five years. I haven't like kind of led the process, which is a very different experience. I think we need to simplify a lot more, a lot more the way we do it. There are definitely a few things on systems that I would have loved to have maybe tested more, or changed a little bit. And to be honest, for us, I think the biggest one has been, I actually think we didn't do it, we did it relatively well, has been the integration with the way we do operations part. part. Because... Normally, in the times of less inflation, they used to be way more separated and they come together kind of in the end because, again, volatility is way smaller. So you get each team to focus on, that, on their bits. Here, we've, the first year, we've been trying to run together, you know, fully together. That's been a real... I wouldn't, it has been a challenge in a good way, I think. Did we get mm-hmm. everything right? Probably not. But like we've partnered with the, with the team a lot more. And I wish there were a lot of things we probably agreed at the start than on the end, because it would have simplified our life. Uh, I think that, I think they're the main ones. But the, always the thing that you always think is there is always underwater stones. I would always get really annoyed, like how did we not test it? But you always find something until you actually do it. You can ask people mm-hmm. to test things so many times, and it's nature that you don't test it fully or you don't do it. You only find these things when you when you are doing the actual process, not preparing to do it. You know? Yep. Yeah. You have a template that you think is going to work perfectly and then it comes back and it's not filled out right. Whatever it might be, the list can go on and on where you're like, but I thought we planned this right. What did we do wrong? And then you you, you mark that down for next year and then there's always something else. It It's never, never ending. Yeah. So that's a, that is a you know good point there. One thing you mentioned that I'd like to ask a little bit about, you talked about this the first year where you kind of sounds like you did financial and operational together, really try to make sure that was integrated versus kind of rolling it up at the end. What have you seen as the benefits of doing it that way? What's, you know, what was the thinking behind that? Oh, I think uh, it, as a bit like a lot of businesses, I think do it and the kind of a changing uh, at the moment is 
you operate on standard cost, right? And mm -hmm. everyone still does it. And then you you have operate. So you make commercial focus on commercial operations, focus on operations, which worked perfectly in a world where we had no inflation or we had stable inflation, plus minus a couple of percent, you know? Yep. In a world where you need to react quickly, you need to give visibility to your commercial teams that they need to know that, hey, guys, we have 20% inflation, 10%, like, you know, you need that agility. So having that together, I mean, I've learned a lot over the last six months because I come from a commercial background. I come from commercial FP&A. I've learned yep. a lot about things like I don't know, deferrals and whatnot, uh, which ordinarily we wouldn't look at on the commercial side. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, it's been quite tricky because process is a bit different, but the real value add is it's one process. It's one, one number, one process. There's no need to realign, yada, yada, yada. And actually, that's the big thing we're doing as a business now. Uh, one of the, the big projects we are running now is integrated business planning, which probably on paper sounds like, oh, isn't that obvious? But making people, behaviors, processes all link and do is a lot harder, which is the, the biggest learning, to be honest, over the last year for me. Uh, but it unlocks so many things, right? Uh, we it, operate it, as it, one uh, unit. It does. And I'm a big fan of integrated business planning and trying to make sure it all holistically hangs together because I hate when you're in a meeting and it's like, well, I didn't sign off on that plan. Oh, where finance came up with this number. Here's what we have. And it's like, all right, so now we're going to spend the rest of the meeting arguing over what's the right number instead of actually supporting the business. Exactly. So there's a lot of benefit. The better you can align it, especially in this environment, like you mentioned, with a constantly changing environment, you almost have to do that. Totally. No, absolutely. Makes, makes a lot of sense. And it is, like you said, it's harder than you think. On the surface, it seems easier. Easy. It's like, okay, you're just aligning it all the way through. Isn't that how it's always supposed to be done? Well, it's not always that simple. Yeah. And look, we're not a, we're a 150 year old business. The way things quite often are built. No, like probably if I rebuilt everything from scratch, like Lego, I might build it a little bit differently. You, you have the, mm -hmm. the limit. I still, st still, the main thing we need to focus on a behavior and process, but some of them have been hindered by some system limitations. And then when we try and change as we're going through now, we're like, ah, okay. But even that, I think it's, it's right. At least we've set up what we need to do. Yes, it doesn't deliver exactly like we wanted to just yet, but at least now we have a roadmap to build. It's like, guys, this is how we want to operate. And now we need, I don't know, be it system X or a fix of this or whatever. And it's much, much better because I think so many companies from the sharing we've done from different companies and probably ourselves partly is the immediate reaction is always, all right, make a tool for this, make a system for this. It doesn't always work uh, because yeah, you need the process and the people first, and then you give them the tool to, to, to make sure it works smoothly. Great point there about needing the people and process first. I've always said technology is an enabler. You know, so many people think it solves the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. You have the right people, the right processes that enables you to be more efficient, to automate things. But if you don't lay the groundwork, have you know the clean data and do all the things, as you know, we'll talk more about that, that have to be done. You know, You end up with a tool that nobody's using or that isn't working the way you want. I think there was a great phrase that someone said to me before. Uh, it's a quote from someone. It's new technologies and old behaviors is expensive old behaviors. I hadn't heard that, but I am going to remember like that. that I one. can't remember, but I'm just trying to, I'm going to give, give a good Google later. But I think that's the phrase. And it's so true. It's so true. We've seen it as well. Yeah, I like that. Basically, new technology, old behaviors is expensive old behaviors. Exactly. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'll probably uh, quote you on that at some point. All righty. One other question here, and then I want to move into a little bit of transformation in your last role. But how do you think about, we talked about budget, we talked about planning. How do you think about forecasting? How do you like to do that? Do you do a rolling forecast, monthly, quarterly? Kind of what's your thoughts? How far out? Just some thoughts around how you think about forecasting. Yeah, look, I mean, it's exactly what we're relooking looking at now with this integrated business planning project is, I think, we're very much not alone in this as a business. We're trying to split properly the horizon focus much more longer term so we can really start scenario planning. I think historically, we've had, we have an annual budget cycle, we have a strategic plan cycle, and then you kind of end up most of the detailed planning from the commercial teams happens really in, the, in too short term. We're trying to split that out and extend. 
uh, in terms of, I mean, it will be more rolling forecast moving forward, but I think we're aiming to look further out, especially and look, especially with the disruption we've seen on supply chain, et cetera. I think any forecast is a forecast. I mean, like we're good, it's a plan. We know it will change. An assumption will change, et cetera. We should be very clear on what they are. Uh, and that's the thing we're changing a lot at the moment to have that integrated plan, have that one number. Now we probably do have one number, no, no doubt about it, but I mean, one number through the entire cycle, et cetera. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's been a bit of a challenge for us as a business because I think COVID has thrown everyone off guard a little bit, right? It probably a exposed some things that weren't working as well before, but yep. also during COVID, no one knew what to do, right? <laughs> like, everyone's like, yeah, we had plus minus 5% or standard deviation or whatever. Now I'm like, you have panic buying, things are going up, down, and it's kind of been ever since a recurrence. Uh, but I think we're doing a lot on that, right? So we have some technology helping us, but naturally we have the sales team focusing on the shorter term. Uh, and we need to act much more in finance as business partners than the people who do the forecast, which I think we've been We've ended up being guilty of because finance has been, ah, we, something looks wrong. We'll grab it and redo, which is, which is, I don't think it's right, uh, to be honest. Um, which we're, we're changing a few bits there. No, I, I appreciate what you're saying there. And that makes a lot of sense. Be able to think a little more long term. I particularly like your point of, you know, right during COVID, none of us knew what to do. I mean, I can't remember how many forecasts I built. Yeah, I think we'll maybe 20% down, maybe 25. And you know, then, oh, this one's 15. This is here. Oh, the, Oh, we need to cut expenses. Okay. Well, we could do this or that. And just every day it was, you know, just scrambling to figure something out. I had a friend who was working for a, you know, consumers good company that made toilet paper and paper towels and they finished their plan. And he goes, you know, day one of COVID, the entire year was just completely blown up. Yeah. Right. All of a sudden they were, they're out of supply and just trying to figure it all out. And it was a real lesson of being more agile. I was like, we just spent five months planning to blow it all up in one day. You know? and yeah, so yeah, yeah. I think we've, we've all been through a little bit of that. It was amazing how quick everything changed when that happened. So let's talk a little bit more about transformations. I know, you know, prior to being head of FP&A, you were leading the finance transformation for Northern Europe. So can you talk a little bit about what that involved? You know, what was the transformation? I think you've hinted at it, probably a little bit aligning the operational and the financial and systems. Maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think so. We've, as a business, we've actively taken a decision. So historically, within the FPNA, you probably had a lot of the tool builders, uh, which always ended up being FPNA is very intense, right? Uh, you're mm -hmm. kind of the cog in the middle of this business that you're constantly running the today, that you can't focus too much on the long term and improving some of the. I think originally like reporting. Yeah. So we we've taken that actually two years out of FPNA within Northern Europe. And created the finance transformation kind of team, uh, which, which which I was part of with, with, with two guys there. I think the focus of the team is very simple, right? It's, it's two things. We need to help the business with one. What are you doing today, business? I think we started in finance, but uh, kind of more wider business. That takes you loads of time. That's manual. That's tedious. It ends up being inaccurate. What can we do with technology to automate it? be it through simple solutions, be it through data visualization on things like Tableau, be it through things like Alteryx, be it through really like Snowflake, SQL, those kind of things. And then question two is, what are the things that we would love to be able to see consistently and all the time, be it new data visibility or be it something else that we don't do today because we don't have the capacity or the data available or we don't have the, the report. Uh, so the, the classic examples are, we should have this manual process where we create when we did the forecast, when you financialize a forecast, it used to be like a day for someone to do it every, every month. Now it happens in 30 minutes. Uh, that's an example of like a tedious manual process that had mistakes. And another one of some of the market pricing. We used to kind of have everyone tracks it on their own way. We now have a central thing on Tableau. It's beautiful. It gets sent out once a week. Uh, here, is, here are the prices you can see, yada, yada, yada for the commercial teams. Uh, so, and we've, we've run a few, uh, quite a few projects, to be honest. Um, and one of them was integrated business planning. So more, more focusing on process. But I think that's the, the biggest learning for me has been is, uh, is the IVP project is that change is difficult, right? I think, and I'm the same. I used to be, I remember myself as a sales finance manager and I used to go to my head of FBA and be like, oh man, we need to do this better. We need to improve this. 
Australia live this doesn't work <laughs> and now I was sitting there being like oh god <laughs> oh no uh, uh, but I think change is difficult and we all want new things and improve things but then when it comes around you're like oh I actually quite like the way I did it before uh, and we, we look and uh, I do that quite a lot I think I'm quite anxious on things I like I want things done quickly, straight away, et cetera, which I think my team will probably reflect on. Uh, but you always think, oh, we're not doing enough. We can do more, et cetera. But then I think you've also got to put it in hindsight is we as the business used to be fully Excel based five, four years ago. Like everything would be in Excel, right? Really. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's, Excel is good for a lot of things. I like Excel. Don't get me wrong. But for standardized reporting and making sure, yeah, got big data sets doesn't handle. So if you're a team with a relatively like a cell, yeah, it can handle it. Big data says it doesn't handle. It. Now we are, I mean, there are definitely things we could improve on speed and other things, but we've, we've partnered with Tableau at the moment as a wider business. And we have at least our kind of master PL data, all of it, and our master sell out data all on Tableau available at a click of a button, which to be fair, if you look at it as a journey, that's, it's, we've, of a longer term, yeah, I think we've, we've progressed for sure. Could we do more? No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's the tagline of anything. Could we do more? And the answer is always yes, right? And, and it'll take everything you can give it. But there's a few things you mentioned there I just want to drill into is, first, you talked about how change is hard for transformations. What, why do you think that is? Why do you think change is the, you know, kind of that hard part for people? I mean, there is that curve. I can't remember what the name of it is. I think it's the change curve or something, but it's the curve of like despair and then elation yeah, yes. and getting used to it. Oh, there are <laughs> kind of like grief, of despair, acceptance or whatever. Exactly. Like, there are different curves. I think, to be honest, I think it's very human. It's very, we're very good at routines and we're actually very adaptable. You know, as humans, we just like, we like doing it. And um, also importantly, change is hard. And I think you, I always reflected on it when I handed over to someone else my job when I moved roles. I opened, let's say, my little Excel model. I looked at it like, oh, look, this is how you do this. This is how you do this. And as I did it, I was like, why did I do this? I could have spent like 30 minutes once and automated it to not spend this five minutes every time, every week or every month, whatever it is. But I never did, you know? And then I said, I kind of felt embarrassed. Like, oh yeah, okay, let's do it now. And I kind of did it there and then. I was like, this is, this is terrible. Like, I should, I should have really done that. And I just think that, to be honest, I really do think it's human. And the one thing that I think to make transformation successful, you really have to, you have to be so close to the business. I think it really helps if you've done the job. So you know the real pain points, but you, and, and it's hard to find people's time, right? Because people are, mm-hmm. they're delivering the today. They're making sure we sell, we produce and all this. So it's hard to kind of get people to say, okay, hang on, spend one hour with me now. And in six months, hopefully I'll be able to save you a day. But, uh, you know, uh, but you really need to, I think the best project, the project that have been the most effective that we've done is really partnered with the business properly. Not like and some of the worst ones I've seen, uh, the ones that have been less successful, like something has just been done and it was only way too late that the business was engaged with it, you know, uh, which then it's hard to, hard to change when you've already invested time and effort and, uh, and money probably. So it's a bit more difficult. So two things stand out to me from, you know, listening to that answer. And so the first is just the importance of partnering closely with the business, right? Communicating and working with them, involving them in every step versus, uh, I know enough, I could put the new process in place and then going and rolling it out to somebody and they're like, I don't want to do that. Like, why would I, you know, why, why would you think that's the process? So it sounds like there's a key, key part there of the closer you collaborate with the business, the easier it's going to be not easy, but the easier it is going to be to implement change. And the second thing, which I love is just your point of human nature. How many of us I've done it so many times I transfer something to the new person. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I never cleaned this up. Oh, yeah, I should have fixed this. Like, you're you're just critiquing your process the whole way through and thinking, why didn't I spend another day and save the three hours or the five minutes or whatever it might be? But we just get so busy and we're just comfortable, as you said, kind of creatures of habit, and it just becomes natural to us. And the next person, you know, is inside, probably just thinking, what was this guy doing? Is your is your transfer? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, oh, for sure, no doubt. You know, but then you get stuck in it. 
Yeah, exactly. Just, you do it in increments. You always, <laughs> you always have to do it in increments. I think that's the bit that I've learned is like, uh, you're never going to get it all in one because yeah, it's impossible. Rolling out any, any big change, don't expect to do it all at once or, well, I mean, go ahead and try that, but it will fail, right? It's a, it's an incremental process. Absolutely. All right. So next, next question, I'm going to kind of switch here again. You've had quite a few different roles. So, you know, you spent two years in a sales finance role. So maybe can you talk a little bit about that experience, what it was like supporting sales and, you know, what are maybe some of the, as you see, the key, key things you need to do to support a sales org? Yeah, no, for sure. I think uh, it was one of my valuable bits of experience because as I say, I'm kind of a wannabe salesperson, but uh, I think it's a cross-functional team, right? You're part mm-hmm. of a cross-functional team and the big difference to any team that inside the business, you could be part of your brand team, category team, or whatever, is you're externally facing. Well, actually you are not, or very much less so, but all your team are. So they have a very different type of pressure, you know? Uh, and of course we all have a common goal, but they have like someone else pulling them all the time, you know, being in sales mm-hmm. is, is, can, can be quite difficult. So I act as always kind of the balance to that, but also hopefully trying to help, help the teams. Of course, I'm the guardian of the, the Heinz p uh, but, but ultimately really trying to help them. I think any commercial finance role as a business partner is a bit of a jack of all trades. You do a kind of a bit of revenue management, a bit of analysis, a bit of FPNA because you run the business cycle and the process for the team, a bit of control because you need to make sure all your deals and allowances are in control and stuff like that. So that, that that's quite good. You know, you we, we always like to call it like you kind of your mini, your mini CFO. you like little, every little team has their own mini CFO. And yep. I think the best sales finance managers will be that to their account lead, the person in charge of the, of the, the sales team. Mm-hmm. But I think. The the formula is easy, right? I think number one, your bread and butter is your rituals and routines. You are the guardian of business. I like you need to make sure we understand the past, understand the future, the present and make the right decisions for the future. I think second part in the sales team is you act as a connection to the internal business, proper connection because you don't spend time externally really. So you make sure you help your sales team and protect them from various pressures internally and help them land those things externally and validate them in a way. Like I've spent a lot of time just chatting to my sales guys saying like a sounding board, can we do this? Can we do that? Et cetera. But mm-hmm. then also helping them with the numbers so they don't get lost while also having, making sure we have the right credibility with the business. And then the third one is oh, the, the, where the fun stuff begins. Is there a real analytic, if you can do the first two, uh, analytics, joint business agreements, investment plans, what makes money, what doesn't make money, how do we negotiate strategies, uh, longer term, all of the, all of these, right? Um, but yeah, it was a very, uh, yeah, a, a, a very interesting role. And I think I always recommend it because it has, it's so multi, like you learn a lot of how a business runs because you kind of, you're a little business in and of itself. I would, I would second that as well. Supporting sales, everybody in finance should have the opportunity. I mean, my experience was invaluable. You brought up a lot of great things there. And one I really liked is the importance of just chatting and talking with them. Hey, can we do this? Can we do that? I remember it got to the point where sales guys would call me and, hey, look, can we do this on this deal? Does this make sense? In some cases, the answer would be no, but here's what we can do. And we had a good enough relationship that I could say no, but it wasn't no in the sense of sometimes finances viewed as like, no, go away. It was no, but let's figure out an alternative. How can we make it happen? Because just financially that, you know, I can't get that approved for you or whatever the case may be. Well, I, I totally agree that communication is just invaluable. They need you as a sounding board because they're not numbers guys, most of them. Yes, yeah, some are, but for the most part, they're not analytical numbers guys, but they're great at relationships. They're often very good at selling. And when you get a great, you know, support for that sales team, you can help them achieve more. Yes, no, totally. And that like, it's always fun. Like, you need to have a good, great relationship with the guys because unfortunately my role was like, they might still think I like saying no to things, but unfortunately <laughs> my role is to, to kind of, to be that kind of control yep. board, right? I'm yep. the guardian of the Kraft Heinz p and and uh, having that really good relationship has been very important. And uh, the, the best sales guys I've worked with, we've had that amazing relationship uh, as well. And then we were able to, 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 to help each other. Yeah. And like you said, at the end of the day, we have to protect the p So there's times we say no, there's times they may be disappointed, but if you've built the relationship and you have the trust, they're going to understand. 
still may be disappointed, but you can continue to work together and you may get the next deal that's great. Right? Yes, yeah, so, no, exactly. So the next question here I want to ask you is just kind of switching a little bit to key metrics. You know, you've been in the consumer packaged goods industry for a while now with Kraft Heinz. What do you find are some of the most valuable metrics that you like to look at that really kind of help you understand the business? Yeah, I think uh, in, obviously internal p and is important. I think we try and combine internal and external a lot more. Uh, I think all the obvious ones, I guess, right? Look, I I look down to EBITDA. Of course, EBITDA, I think margin is becoming more and more important in the world of inflation, right? Not just absolute mm-hmm. numbers, the margin. I think we're moving as a business as we connect way closer with ops at the gross profit and gross profit margin, which we've probably historically just looked at uh, commercial margin. Now we look at total margin, which I think has been very important. So I think that has become very a big one. Look, anything in, in the PBM, uh, price, PBM price, so the, the, the proper price, not just uh, sales over volume. Uh, I think all very important. And then look, I think we're... In, Historically, in finance, we would maybe look a little bit less in volume and look much more kind of net sales and a sweeper ton of price and some form of margin and margin percentage, be it gross profit or EBITDA. We're actually looking a lot more at volume now. You kind of know volume as a, as a function of net sales and, and a sweeper ton or net sales per mm-hmm. ton, but we're looking a lot more uh, because we're looking a lot more at consumer penetration and those external metrics. Because in, in, in high inflationary times, I think every business is pushing through significant pricing plans, right? I mean, I've seen my weekly shop go up quite a bit. That's very important for us, right? I think as a brand in the UK, we are one of the biggest brands in the UK, Heinz, the number two brand in the UK. Uh, so, uh, and our biggest competitor is probably private label. It's way bigger in the, in the UK than it is in the US, like double the size. And oh, of wow. course, in inflationary pressure, that's been our biggest one. And I think looking at penetration and value and value and volume market share, so more external metrics has been really important. And that kind of price index versus our competitors. Uh, I named probably quite a few there. I think these are the most important ones. That's helpful. And I really liked how you mentioned in an inflationary environment, right? Those private labels and understanding the index, understanding how they're pricing. And so there's the internal of understanding your own P and L and your own numbers, but I like how you brought in also understanding the external environment and being able to look at those metrics and see how those, you know, uh, how those impact what you do and the decisions you make, especially in this ever changing environment we're in. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what I think often in finance, you get kind of not stuck, but you look at only your finance metrics. I think it's super important for, yeah, I'm going to always be biased to my probably EBITDA margin, right? On my delivery versus budget, on my profit, you know, for the business. But you need to see the bigger picture. Uh, and that's how you think you could, you become the, uh, the, the best business partner. In fact, not just in FPNA, in FPNA, you are probably your, you're the biggest business partner to the leadership team of, of, of your business in any cell. Like that's, you understand the holistic picture, you understand how these things interact, right? I think that that's very important. Agree. So now we're going to move on to kind of some more standard questions, some things we like to ask all of our guests. And I'm going to start with one that's a little more personal. Can you tell me something unique about yourself, something we would not find online, something you can share with our audience? Oh, what would be unique? Uh, (laughs) That's a really good question, actually. I think as a head of FBA, it was quite unique is that I don't want to be a CFO. I don't know. Uh, Yeah. Uh, I mean, wherever my career takes me, I don't mind, but uh, definitely don't want to be a CFO. I think I tell you what's probably, well, relatively unique, where I want to end up and retire, have a vineyard somewhere in New Zealand and drive a tractor and uh, taste taste my wine. I think that would be my <laughs> perfect retirement. Well, when you hit that, I want a picture. Ah, I'll send you a bottle of my finest wine, hopefully, All if right. I make it. There, there, there we go. Sounds fun. Yeah. And I would say most of the guests we have on, a lot of them do want to be a CFO. So that is a little unique as well for a finance audience. So I, I wouldn't like say that. no, don't get me wrong, but I don't think sure. I have, if you ask me what I want to be in 10 years time, I don't think, uh, I would say probably CFO. It, it's not your primary goal or aspiration. If it happens, great, but it's not what you're planning for, so to speak. Yes, exactly. Makes sense. All right. So this next one, we ask everybody this, this is a fun one, you know, DataRails is our sponsor. 
So they're big, uh, big fans of Excel. They have a platform built around Excel. So what's your favorite, could be Excel formula, function, feature. What's your favorite thing in Excel? I'm going to go for probably, well, I hope it's a relatively unique. I'm going to go for an if or ifs. Uh, and I mean, there's so many formulas, so many great things, but I think <laughs> having done a lot of things in things like Ultrix and Tableau, which you sometimes, you leverage some of the learnings you've done in Excel, right? But I think the power of an if is just, it's just huge. You know, you have all the V lookups, H lookups, all the index matches, they're all fantastic and direct, but I think uh, I'm going to go for an ifs. No, good if statement, ifs. I mean, I learned SQL. I remember writing case statements, which are basically an if statement or switch exactly. statements. You know, exactly. just that logic. And there's so many different ways you can do it. Precisely. But just the idea of being able to write a good if statement that works. There's such a great feeling, especially when you have a long, complex one. I can remember some very long case statements and getting all done and going, does the number look like it makes sense? It does. Thank you. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You, you know those when you like kind of, I just sit there, like almost separate them into three separate formulas and check and then combine them. You're like, yes, it's there. <laughs> yes. Oh, so many times where you do the first, you're going through step by step. Like, it worked. It worked. It, you know, the, the number looks right. <laughs> or sometimes yeah. it's, oh crud, that's nowhere close to right. Where did I yeah. mess up? Yeah, yeah. And then you could never unpick it. And it's like, I don't know, it's like four lines of it. And you're like, oh my God. Uh, and then you probably go for a beer. Give up yeah, no, leave. I saw a shirt that said, roses are red, violets are blue. You have a left bracket on line 42. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. And very I've been good. joking, I need to buy that shirt because I've definitely experienced that more than once. <laughs> so Very good. We got two more questions here for, for you before we let you go. So one we like to ask people, because we feel like, you know, I, I've always been a believer that uh, failure leads to success. The failures are really just learning experiences. So maybe can you talk about a career failure you had and what you learned from that? You know, analysis gone wrong, a budget that got messed up, whatever it might be. And what was your kind of your learning from that experience? Yeah, I think uh, I think the biggest ones, I mean, there should have been loads of little ones, but uh, as we've been integrating a few new processes this year, uh, I think we've delayed a lot versus where, well, not a lot, maybe, to be honest, I, I reflected on it and I spoke to a few people and they're like, this is so normal. But I think the biggest, <laughs> well, I was like, oh, well, I'm not that happy that it is normal, but we'll live with it. But I think, look, driving big change takes time. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe it's not necessarily a failure, but I think even this year we've delayed, like we've had to delay things because we're quite a lean organization overall, I think. And you have to kind of like, you take time out to invest in the future. I think that's been a real, like, how do you deal with that? I think it's been quite difficult. But look, you, you learn, right? I think, uh, especially in my role now, power of communication, managing multiple stakeholders, importantly, both up and down because, and parallel, but like it's in all directions. It's not just one way. Um, I think that this has become so much more important. You really underestimate it. Uh, and I think I underestimated it, actually. I, I think you're human. I think uh, first, probably everybody underestimates it some and you adjust for the next time. So it's a great lesson to learn. That's all we can do is try to learn and implement it so we don't end up with, a, you know, expensive old behaviors, as you said earlier. Exactly. So what advice would you offer to someone starting their career today in FPNA? So someone came to you and said, Hey, you know, can you give me some advice? I'm looking, I, you know, maybe just finished college or grad school or whatever, and I want to work in FPNA. What advice would you give them? Yeah, I think that's all. I think it's a great place to start. And the reason is you get, and if, as an analyst, you'll work hard, but you get unparalleled visibility with the leadership and visibility of the business, which I think is fantastic. You'll also learn a lot of core skills, right? Like Excel, building a model, understanding kind of core processes. The advice I would give is all like, definitely learn how to prioritize. Definitely don't be scared to make mistakes and just go there and, and do things and pick up new things. To be honest, I don't think it's specific of PNA advice necessarily, but I've always been as whatever you get given or offered or whatever the opportunity is, take it, learn and you will just, it will, it will just happen, you know, and you will, you will get going. Uh, I mean, from FPNA specific, I think the one thing I would do is, uh, look, it's a certain profile. Uh, it's a certain profile. 
uh, you need to really like it. You need to like numbers. You need to like getting things right, reconciling things, etc. Um, mm-hmm. So I think be prepared for that. Uh, but it will reap you great rewards. Couldn't agree more that, you know, there's great rewards, great opportunity, but you need to be prepared and it is a certain profile. So last thing here, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you or learn more about you, what's the best way to connect with you? Yeah, I think probably LinkedIn is the easiest one, right? Uh, we're all there. It's the, it's the, the social network of uh, connecting about career and stuff. Yeah, so LinkedIn is the easiest one. So uh, always, always happy to connect. Well, and we'll have that in the show notes for people that you know, they can connect with you on LinkedIn. I figured that's what you say. I mean, that's the standard answer these days. We all no, go to LinkedIn. Didn't, didn't surprise so. you there. Would have been strange <laughs> yeah, no. if I said like Instagram. Uh, that that would have been a, a weird one. <laughs> I was waiting for you to say something like Mastodon, right? The new one that I guess is kind of coming up like a replacement for Twitter or something. I've heard since all the you know challenges they've had with Twitter, they added like a million followers in a week or something. Wow. So not a, not a bad week for them. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> Not at all. So, well, thank you so much for being on the show. We've really enjoyed having you. We're excited to you know, our guests have the opportunity to listen to this episode. So, thanks again for you know carving out some time and and enjoy your holiday season, your Christmas, your New Year's, you know, all those celebrations. And we'll uh, look forward to chatting to, with you again soon. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Paul. It's been it's been great to have. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Always happy to chat on FNA. And likewise, have an amazing Christmas and a happy New Year. <laughs>